Hey, there's a bubble. How do you know? Trust me, call Venet. Buy 50 millions in swaps on the MBS. Mark, you sure? Yeah. Yeah, it's time to call bullshit. What is going on, everyone? And welcome to Rec Talk. And today, I want to talk about things that I don't see anyone else talking about on YouTube or in prof even in professional journalism. Everyone's focused on conference realignment and TV market media deals, viewership. Um, if you're an ACC fan, lawsuits and chasing the, the dollar and um, keeping up with the Joneses of the SEC and the Big Ten. What I don't see anyone talking about is how sustainable is this? In other words, is there a bubble in the college football market? And I had a financial expert on to talk about conference realignment about a month or two ago, Tony Altimore. I really uh, encourage you to go follow him on Twitter. He does a ton of really good financial analysis on everything that has to do with college football. And as I was preparing for that interview, I had all these questions to ask. And the last one was really a throwaway question. I had just noticed that the rate of these contracts and revenue, it's all doing this. And I just wondered how sustainable it was. I thought there's probably nothing to it. Let me ask him. And this is what he said. Check it out. I, it seems like there's an arms race going on between the big and the SEC. And it, it smells to me very much like the Carnegie's and all these railroad barons where they're just going to control everything. That That's the downside in, in the ACC is you just don't have the power in the say-so that these two conferences do. So is, is there any exposure in this for like ESPN or Fox? Is there like... In my show notes, I put bubble. That's not the right word, but I, you kind of see. No, what bubble's doing. probably a good word because I mean, here's a here's a question, right? Like, are they going to continue like this rapid rise in media rights? Right. That, that's fueled on kind of an old cable model that's already crumbling. How does that affect this? How close are we to saturating this college football market? When you think about a bubble, you know, I mean, one of the questions for the ACC might be. If, they're, if they think there's a bubble, and I'm not, again, I'm not a TV futurist, I defer to the, the people who are, if they think there is a bubble, do you just kind of have to survive until it pops for some of these people in 2030? Do you have to wait for 08? So here's the thing, 2030, Big 12 and SEC all expire like 20, what, 2029, 2030, 2031. So if there is a reset, there are changes, the value, you know, the value comes out of there. You know, there's plenty of industries who have seen uh, what happened. Look at the music industry. Um, you know, what happens when the the riches funding you go away? This it's like, for example, do you know about the Democrat the demographic cliff that's about to hit? I don't. Uh, educate me, please. Other people will not be. And a lot of schools are going to close. They're going to have to merge. And so when you think about this, this is going to be hitting as well as all these increases in sports costs. Um, there's going to be real changes and the, the business model is going to. So after talking to Tony, it seemed like at best things were unclear and at worst, there could be something to be concerned with. My takeaway was it was definitely worth taking a better look at. So what I did is I looked at total TV viewership. just. If you take everything everyone's watching and look at that, how has that trended over the past decade or two? Then I looked at sports, particularly live TV viewership. That's what we're concerned with in college football. Uh, most, if not all of the viewership there is a live viewership. And then I looked at college football. And at the end, I'll ask the question, is there a bubble? And we'll talk about it. Now, if you're not quite sure what a bubble is, We'll talk about it when we discuss is college football, is the college football market in a bubble? We'll define it. Um, you might learn something today. So first, let's talk about Nielsen ratings. So I know in the entire time that I've watched TV, you hear, I've heard about Nielsen ratings. I don't really know what they are. What a Nielsen rating does is it tells you what percentage of American households are watching a particular broadcast or a program at that time. For example, a Nielsen rating of 11.1 .1 will tell you about 11.1% of all households in the United States are watching that program. So what has total TV viewership done? If you take all shows and average them together, is the Nielsen rating increasing or decreasing? 
So it probably doesn't come as a surprise to anyone that it's been decreasing. Now, I'm going to throw a graphic up. This isn't the straight Nielsen rating, but the average time Americans are spend watching TV. Now, it's crazy to me that in 2008, I guess people were spending 11 hours of their day, of their day watching TV. And the reason I want to look at total time is when you watch a college football game, that is a massive investment in time, right? So if you average, I don't know, four hours a day watching TV, and then you decide to watch a college football game, that's like 80 or 90% of your average viewership for that day. Now, you're probably going to watch more TV on the weekends, but you get the picture. And look, this is why it's so profitable. There's a ton of advertisements you get to put in a college football game. I mean, what was the um, Super Bowl ad uh, spend? Like probably four, five, six, seven million dollars. Um, the point being that people are just watching less TV, right? So when you look at that and you look in the future and this trend continues, probably something to be a little bit concerned with as far as advertiser spend and just total viewership in general. So let's look at other sports now. How are other sports faring and just live TV viewership in general? So if you aren't aware, for example, baseball is in an abysmal state with viewership right now. Basketball is not doing fantastic either. In fact, for all pay TV households for live viewership has decreased of over 30 million viewers over about the past decade. And if you're noticing something with these trends, right, looking back to hours spent watching TV, they all start a pretty tough decline around 2018. So around the pandemic, around the time inflation started increasing, all these trends for viewership and people paying for live TV services took a hard decline. Now, we talked about baseball. Baseball and NBA finals viewership over the same time period over the last decade are down 30%. So I'm not just talking about a meaningless um, regular season NBA or baseball game. I'm talking about the premier championship game or games, the finals for those sports are down 30%. Um, it's huge, right? And uh, the, then the question is, well, what's going on there? Why is that? And I think that'll become more clear as we look at why college football is the exception. So if we look over a similar time frame, college football is trending in the opposite direction. It's actually up 20%. So th th there's reasons for that. So from 2013, according to Fox, viewership is up 20%. Why does college football seem to be immune? One, gambling. A lot more people gamble on college football, and a lot of people like to gamble on teams that they don't, um, that are, isn't their home team, right? That they're not a homer for. And there's various reasons for that. Go watch gambling channels for that. The point being is that it increases the viewership of teams that you don't watch, right? And it probably increases total viewership. The biggest reason is that there's just less football games. This is for the NFL, but particularly for college football, I don't know if there's a sport that has less regular season games attached to it. So you, where you're apt, I mean, I don't know who watches every Braves game. Like I'm a Braves fan. I'm in Atlanta. Who watches every regular season baseball game of the team they root for? Hardly anyone, probably less than 1%, maybe even less than a 10th of a percent. Now, you ask a college football fan, let's say you're a Michigan fan, how many Michigan fans watch every single game Michigan plays, including all regular season games? Probably 75% or more. All right. So that's what's different with college football is just each game means more because there's less games. So now for the meat and potatoes of the video, what you came here for, is there a bubble in college football? Well, first, what is a bubble? So I wrote a pretty good definition here. A bubble is an economic cycle characterized by rapid increases in the price of an asset to a point that it is unsustainable. So as far as rapid increase, just look at what's happening in college football now with media rights and people wanting to get out of the ACC. Check. There is a rapid increase of the asset. Now we need to look at, to answer the question, is there a bubble? Is this sustainable, 
right? Well, if you think back to what um, was hurting other sports viewership, like baseball. Well, one, it's really difficult to watch. There's all these blackouts and things. It affects college football, too. It affects baseball worse. But it is the structure of how those schedules run that I think hurts them the most. Now, college football's structure is fundamentally changing. In fact, everything about college football that made it college football in the past is changing. We have the advent of NIL. Um, We have portal. Academics have become less and less and less important. But most importantly, we're changing the schedule. College football realignment or conference realignment is changing who teams play, what excites fans about that team. A lot of times is well-established rivalries and conference rivalries. Now we're going to a 12-team playoff, which by definition is going to mean at least certain regular season games mean less. And it's going to give people less of a reason to watch them. So we got to look at like how is that going to affect viewership? Again, this is the very thing that hurts other sports. All right. Is realignment cannibalizing college football, uh, the college football viewer base? So what do I mean by that? Well, there's only a, a very finite number of primetime slots. So for each network, there's generally a 7 p.m. primetime slot. Some, it's between 7 and 8. And then there's a Thursday night primetime slot. But there's really, for me, two primetime slots per network. Now, as we start putting all of the best teams in the same two conferences, there's going to be really good matchups that just aren't put in a primetime spot. Now, we've already established people have less and less time to watch TV, so they might only get to watch a a game in that primetime slot. So we have Texas and Oklahoma coming to the SEC now. We have UCLA, USC, Oregon and Washington now in the Big Ten. There's only so many games you can watch where if those teams, just due to them being in the same conferences, you're going to have major matchups the same week. And you're going to have to pick which game you watch, where if they were spread out and they weren't in the same week, you would probably watch both games. For example, week one of this season, Um, they're not in the same conference, but Texas A&M and Notre Dame are playing in the primetime slot and Georgia and Clemson are in a noon spot. And I know fans of both of those teams that are kind of scratching their head. Why are they in a noon slot? Um, well, again, there's only so many to go around. And as these teams get moved into the same conferences, this problem is just going to get worse and worse and worse moving down the road. So we have to ask ourselves, like, how is this going to affect viewership? How does this work into these new you know, contracts that just keep rising and rising and rising. And at at some point, is this going to start to run back downhill? Might there be some buyer's remorse? And honestly, I think, I think there will be. I think if we look forward in a decade, you know, Tony and I were talking about 2030 thereabouts is when the new contracts come about. Will we see contracts that are less than the previous ones minus inflation? We could very well. The next thing I want to talk about, and this is probably the biggest thing, is people just have less money to invest in watching college football, going to games. Uh, Attendance at games is already down, right? So I'm going to throw a graph up of uh, inflation rates. And again, we see these things start to spike. Now, they lag the 2018 trend by about two years, but in 2020, inflation absolutely skyrocketed. And I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Even McDonald's has recognized this now. McDonald's is is rolling out new items on the dollar menu. Um, A lot of non-essential goods, companies that produce non-essential goods are now really having to try and get back um, customers because people just don't have as much money to spend. Another thing I want to talk about is the total debt that people are carrying. That's also going to determine what you're able to buy. And with 
the way that these contracts are going now or the way viewership is like, okay, so I need like an SEC network subscription and an ESPN plus subscription, an ACC network and a Fox and then Valley sports or whatever your regional character is that might get blacked out. I mean, at a certain point you're paying as much as you did for cable just to try and watch all of these games you want to watch. Right? So before pre pandemic total credit card debt in this country was under 800 million. And we're now trending to go over 1.2 trillion in total credit card debt. And we're currently over 1.1 trillion in credit card debt. Now that's another video for another channel as to far, as far as is there a major recession looming? I tend to think there is just because people are going to exhaust every bit of, um, credit that they have, and they're going to get to a point where they can't even meet their basic obligations. But again, that's another video for another time. Um, and just to add insult to injury, I mean, housing prices, the average median housing price has just skyrocketed as well. And the housing market is way more cooked than it even was in 2008. And for that chart, that's only the median. Like I li I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, good luck finding a house for less than $400,000 in a place you would want to live in Georgia. Texas is another cooked market. We're not even going to talk about California. The point being, how much money are people going to have to spend on these streaming services, on cable, and their ability to watch and or go to these games? It has to take a hit if these things don't start rolling back that we looked in with inflation, housing prices, total credit card debt. And might we get to a point where even diehard college football fans have to start making cuts there? Again, if these trends keep the way they keep going the way they are, that's absolute that's a that's a certainty. That's an absolute certainty. Also how stable is the population or how steady is the population growth? So unfortunately, no one likes to think, <laughs> you know, about, about death or anything, but, um, a certain part of your viewership is going to die. Are you replacing them with an equal amount or more? And for these, uh, revenue trends to keep increasing, not only do you have to replace them, but you got to, re you got to replace them with more, right? So there's two things Tony talked about in 08. There was a major dip. I'll show you one that happened post-pandemic in 2020 uh, as well. So there's two major dips. So not only are you going to have, uh, according to what we're looking at, people with less money to spend on non-essential things like college football, but you're going to have less people with less <laughs> amounts to spend on these things. Total enrollment at these schools is going to decrease. That's something else that funnels you uh, college football fans. All right. So we've also seen post-pandemic a, a major hit in the technology industry. That's why they're all pivoting to AI. There is absolutely an AI bubble. That's another video for another time. But to make up for the hit that these companies took, tech companies took in uh uh, post pandemic, they're all now pivoting and trying to rebrand as an AI company to artificially bolster um, their margins. But I also wonder if, because of that, the quality of these streams and the investment in these streams might take a hit too, right? They do because technology companies, all they're concerned about is the bottom line, which is what is their stock price doing? And that really brings us to um, another good point is I, I can hear someone typing, well, look, the people that govern this, that govern these networks, these conference, uh, not conference, well, conference commissioners, yeah, there are a lot of smart people. They wouldn't expose themselves to the kind of risk like this. Well, to that, I would say, look at a documentary called Enron, the smartest guys in the room. A lot of smart people that, that made a lot of very short-sighted decisions to make money now that were awful in the long run. In fact, their CFO, Andy Fastow, bet their whole company on the fact or bet their whole company on the gamble that their stock price would never fall. And I kind of feel like that's what's going on with these TV contracts. We're betting the, uh, the whole kitchen sink on the gamble that viewership will never decrease. And I, I just don't, I don't think that that is smart, especially when, as we've talked about, it seems like there's an economic uh, crisis looming. Look, we've already seen regional 
providers, Bally Sports, that's, you know, if you're a Florida State fan and Clemson fan, you know about that. That has to do with part of their grievances, things that are in these court filings. But we're, we're seeing the small fries file for bankruptcy now. It's not, it's not a good indicator for what is to come and how stable this market is. So what is, what does that all boil down to? What are people going to do in response to this? They're just going to pirate. In other words, they're going to steal the streams. They're not going to pay for it. They're going to find another way of watching it, probably via theft. And if the comp- the tech companies have already taken a hit, I don't know how much money they're going to invest in anti-piracy measures. And you're never going to be able to decrease that to zero anyways. And as people get more and more financially strained, they're, the effort they're going to put into pirate, excuse me, pirating these streams uh, <laughs> is going to go up. I guess moving toward the end of the video, I watched a really good video uh, someone did on media, the media market in baseball. And he said something that, that was really interesting to me. He said, the sport isn't the product, the fan is. And the customers are the advertisers. And it makes me wonder if these people that are making the decisions for all of these contracts and the media and the conference realignment, do they really even fully understand their own business model? It would be so nice in one way um, to maybe avoid this or lessen the hurt that might be coming down the horizon is giving this away for nearly free and letting the advertisers pay for it. Look at what YouTube is doing, what you're watching now. I mean, I hardly ever watch TV. I watch what I want on YouTube. I have creators I like. You can eat, There's even a pay model uh, for no ads, and there's YouTube TV. Um, that whole landscape has totally changed. I think you should give these streaming services away for a very, very small fee and really let the advertisers pay for it. I doubt that's going to happen because then the, the their number in a spreadsheet is a little less. And we've already talked about, I'm telling you, these companies, they don't think long-term like they should. They just don't. And I do think that they will expose them to some hurt coming down the road. I guarantee you, and I've said this if it, for anyone that's watched my channel, there are clauses in these contracts that if revenue and total viewership decrease below a certain threshold, it probably kicks in a renegotiation or something like that. So to answer the question, do I think there's a bubble in college football? Everything I look at indicates that, you know, we've seen it time and time again before 08 eh, that there, no, nope, there's no bubble. This is going to continue in the future. Anytime you see trends that just go straight up, it's not sustainable. Something's got to give. Something's got to change. I think we'll look back 10 years from now and say, man, um, more people should have been talking about this. Let me know what you think in the comments. Is there a bubble in college football? Ha- have ESPN and Fox exposed them to some financial hurt coming down the road? Are schools exposing themselves to some hurt? Look, these athletic budgets are bellowing, and there's only a handful of schools that are going to be able to withstand a major downturn. And as Tony said in the beginning, there are going to be schools that close. Uh, enrollment's going to go down. Again, let me know what you guys think. Thanks for watching the video. Hopefully, I've, I've earned a subscribe. Uh, if you want to subscribe, we would really appreciate that. And I'll talk to you guys later.